Sunday is a constant reminder for us because we can get so caught up in the things of life that we forget what it costs. And so I, I think these are always good reminders for us. And then also, uh, just the fellowship time that we have together. And, and I, I don't know about you, but coming in here smelling all that good food, I'm like, man, I need to keep it short today so we can go eat, right? Good, nobody said amen to that. So what? Well, <laughs> Well, it is good to, to be here this morning and walking through His Word. And, and I have to admit that we're going to be in Ecclesiastes 4, so you can go ahead and take your Bibles and, and open there. This is a difficult text to interpret, as well as praying over, okay, Lord, how do I take this text and try to teach it in, in a way that, that's going to help us? Because as we walk down through this text, there, there's going to be some things that it just seems like this text is disjointed in some way. But I pray that we'll understand what Solomon is talking about here as we walk through this. You know, relationships are, are difficult. Good, and keeping good relationships and, and having strong ones, uh, they, they need to be highly prized. We need to make a lot of effort into having good relationships. But sadly, we live in a society right now that is a highly technological age. And that collection of names on a social media account has often replaced the construct of true friends. Even with that myriad of social friends on those accounts, there are many in our society that suffer from loneliness and even depression. The rat race of a fast-moving culture is often driven by those ambitious people, and it leaves little to no time to build lasting, strong relationships. And there's, in this world, there's a reckless spirit. There's a reckless spirit that just wants to step on the little guy, step on the medium-sized guy, or whoever it is, to get to that next level. And so that, that pursuit of that which they have deemed as, this is what makes my life have meaning... A lot of people get hurt in the process. And so in that kind of world, we need to have relationships with people that are going to lift us up or else the weight of the world can easily crush us and cause us to forsake many things. Building strong relationships is a recurring theme throughout the Scriptures. In fact, one of my favorite verses is what I've called the teenager's verse. And it's a teenager's verse because it's in the book of Proverbs. Great book for Proverbs. Okay, for a teenager is to study the book of Proverbs. And it's easy to remember because when do you start being a teenager? Age 13. When do you stop being a teenager? Age 20. So Proverbs 13, 20 says this, He who walks with the wise grows wise, but a companion of fools suffers harm. Great truth, not just for teenagers, but for us as adults as well. Surrounding ourselves with the right kind of people. Being the right kind of people. But, but the problem is we tend to fill our lives with, with so much extra stuff that we've pushed strong relationships to the side. Now granted, some of those things can, uh, are needed. All right? But there are times where I, I think we've just lost the sight of what it means to build strong relationships. I often hear people say, I'm just too busy. I've just got too much stuff going on in my life. I just don't have time to do anything else. I've also heard people say, well, I deal with enough people at work, so I don't want to deal with any more people after that. So they lose sight of the real purpose. See, one of our key principles that we talked about when we were putting out our vision, one of those principles was relationship-focused. We've gone on record as a church of being relationship focused, meaning that we're going to be intentional about building into each other. We're going to confront one another when confrontation is needed. We're going to love each other. We're going to comfort each other. We're going to push each other towards a greater level of maturity in Christ. And Solomon is going to take this time of his writing in Ecclesiastes to focus on relationships. In his view of, of things that were happening in the world. Relationships are, are something that all of us need to take a good inventory on. One of the things that Old Testament writers would do is they would often use comparisons and contrasts to bring their point across. 
And what we're going to see here in Ecclesiastes 4 is there's some comparisons and some contrasts. And I think that as we walk through these, we can kind of understand what he's saying here and gain some insight. He's made some observations of life under the sun. And through these observations, we can gain some insight into this. You're going to see the, the contrasting comparisons with the phrase better than. He's going to use that throughout this text to tell us this is better than that. This kind of person is better than that kind of person. And, and trying to get us to understand. Trying to get us to understand something. And that is this. Relationships are more valuable than accomplishments. Relationships are more valuable than accomplishments. And so as we walk through this, there are going to be some things that we're going to need to explain a little bit, but as we walk through this, I think you'll see what Solomon is going after. He may not come right out and say it. And that's what makes Old Testament texts a little bit difficult, is in the New Testament you can say, oh, here's, here's his clear point, where Solomon in the poetry, it's kind of alluded to. All right, And that's the nature of Hebrew poetry, and so we're going to kind of walk through. But I think as we understand this text, it's going to point to relationships being more valuable than accomplishments. So why then do we need strong relationships? Well, I hope that we can gain some insight in three ways. First one, we need meaningful relationships that bring comfort in days of difficulty. Okay, we're going to see that in verses 1 through 3. We need relationships meaningful relationships that bring comfort during difficult days. Then I looked again at all the acts of oppression which were being done under the sun. And behold, I saw the tears of the oppressed and that they had no one to comfort them. And on the side of the oppressors was power, but they had no one to comfort them. So I congratulated the dead who were already dead more than the living who are still living. But better off than both of them is the one who has never existed, who has never seen the evil activity that is done under the sun. Now you might read that and you're like, whoa, Solomon, what in the world are you saying? Are you really saying that it's better that no one ever existed? And there are some people probably today who are in our culture that they're saying, yeah, we have too many people in our world and they're trying to do everything they can to eliminate it. That's kind of where they would say Solomon is going, but that's not what he's saying. Let's walk through and try to understand what he's saying here. The all acts of oppression that he's talking about there. Remember Solomon, he's pursuing all of these things to try to find meaning. And what he's seen is that the way that people interact with one another, there's a lot of oppression going on. There's a lot of difficult things happening from people to people. They're mean to each other. There's all different kinds of things. And he had just talked about in chapter 3 that oppression that happens in court. right? But now he, he's really broadening the scope and talking about oppression that happens all over. And the focus here is on the effect of the oppression. Notice in verse 1, the word comfort. He talks about comfort twice. He says the oppressed are not comforted. But then at the end of verse 1, he also says the oppressors are not comforted. Now we can understand why those who are oppressed don't receive comfort. But those who are in power, who do the oppressing, why would they need comfort? What, what's, the, what's the purpose there? Well, we'll talk about this a little bit more later. But if, if you just look down at the end of chapter 4 here, you see some kings that are replaced. Right? Well, like I said, we'll talk about that here in, in just a moment. But what we're going to understand here is that people are fickle. And that those relationships that even a king would have, he's going to lose them. Because people are fickle. And even those oppressors who are in power, they're going to live a lonely life. They're going to be lonely. All right? and, and so they're going to need comfort too. And then when you look at verses 2 and 3, uh, Solomon is really using terms of exaggeration here. So I congratulated the dead who are already dead more than the living who are still living. But better off than both of them is the one who has never existed who has never seen the evil activity that is done under the sun. He's employing exaggerated terms here to get us to see the point. He said the oppression is so bad. The things that man is doing to man, it's so bad. There is so much 
pain in all of this that it would be better that nobody ever existed so they wouldn't have to go through that pain. That's a term of exaggeration to get us to the point where he's, he's calling out for someone to comfort. That's what he's doing here. He is, he's exaggerating all of this to point to the fact that in all of these oppressors, who's going to be the ones who stand up and comfort? Who are going to be the ones who provide that comfort for people? And, and it's such a grievous nature, this corruption that he's seen. And the way that people interact with one another. There's a desperate need for someone to come alongside and to comfort in life. In the New Testament, there are a number of one another commands. I think the very reason those are there is because God knew what life under the sun is going to be like. He knew that it was going to be a hard life here. Because of sin and the effects of sin on the world. And that we would need strong relationships. And so he commanded us in those relationships on how to interact. And so there's a lot of one another passages to get us to the point where we're intentional about caring for one another. Why? Because this world is hard. I'm not going to ask for a raise of hands, but I I think every single person in here would agree that this world is hard. Living under the heavens Right now, it's a difficult life. And we need each other. We need one another to help us through that. See, God never designed us to live on an island in isolation. God never wanted us to do that. When the world is crashing in on us, we need the close friendships of others to help us navigate those difficult times. Early on in my ministry career, I had an elderly pastor tell me that the ministry is a lonely profession. You cannot have friends in the church. Because if you have friends in the church, they're going to look at you're showing favoritism to one family over another. And so you you just need to recognize that if you're going to do this ministry for the rest of your life, it's going to be a lonely profession. And for a a good while, I bought into that. I, I, I drew lines and I said, I can't let people cross this line because I don't want to be accused of showing favoritism anywhere. And so so I, I did. I kept people at bay. Boy, were we wrong. Boy, were we wrong. I think back to that pastor and I think about how hard and sad his life must have been. To think that he could live life here without friends. Just in the short one and a half years that we've been here, it's hard to believe we're on year two already, All right, But just in that short time, that we've been here, y'all have stepped up and you've proved that philosophy wrong. You've proven that philosophy wrong in the fact that just in our lives, the way you have come alongside us and the things that we've experienced, y'all have answered the call. Y'all have answered that call. And I can can tell you that there are others within the body who are experiencing that comfort that comes with strong relationships. And really, it's an example of 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Keep your finger here for just a moment. And just let's go to 2 Corinthians, I'm sorry, chapter 1. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Let's look at verse 3. What we're talking about here is all of us heeding the call to be the comforters, knowing that we live in an oppressed time where people are struggling through life. And there's a need, a desperate need for people to be comforters. And so in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, we read this, starting in verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our affliction so that we will be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. Do you see what Paul's going after here? Look how many times he uses the word comfort. Let's keep going, all right? For just as the sufferings of Christ are ours in abundance, so also our comfort is abundant through Christ. But if we are afflicted, it is for your comfort and salvation. Or if we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which is effective in the patient enduring of the same sufferings which we also suffer. And our hope for you is firmly grounded, knowing that as you are sharers of our sufferings, so also you are sharers of our comfort. 
We understand that God is the God of all comfort. All comfort comes from Him. I think what this text is pointing to is the fact that believers are the instrument by which God brings comfort. That word for comfort is the same word used to describe the ministry of the Holy Spirit. The word paraclete means to come alongside. So when you think about that concept of the ministry of the Holy Spirit is to provide comfort, and then in 2 Corinthians 1, he talks about us having comfort and we're to share that comfort. What that means is that the Holy Spirit is wanting to use us to provide comfort to other people. That's how he ministers comfort. It's through us. So we need to stop and think about that for just a moment. And the sobering thought is that to the degree that we do not make efforts to strengthen relationships and to be those sources of comfort, it is to that degree that we diminish the comfort of God in the life of someone else. Stop to think about that. If we're going to be selfish with the comfort that we get, then we're robbing someone else of truly experiencing the comfort of God. We have experienced the comfort of God firsthand. And who better to share the comfort with others than those who have experienced it firsthand? You may be the only person in that individual's life who can provide the source of comfort that they need. So we need to consider how much time and effort we're expending to developing those kind of relationships. Or we can be the people who are providing comfort through word, through deed. Are you taking the time to consider that for you? To be that kind of person? So we need to be that kind of friend. We need to surround ourselves with the kind of friends that are going to bring us comfort. Not comfort in the fact that, that maybe if we're walking in sin and you know, we're walking in and contrary to God's Word, we don't want a friend who's just going to comfort us and saying, oh, that's okay. We want those friends that are going to confront us when we need to be confronted, right? That's comfort. It's to know that they love us enough to say, look, you need to change your path here. You need to change your direction or, or you're going to end up going down a destructive path. So, so we need those friends who are going to comfort us in our times of need and our times of um, being exhorted to change. So we need to be those kind of friends and surround ourselves with those kind of friends. Second insight I think we can gain from this text is this. We need meaningful relationships to help us alleviate the frustrations of life. What we're going to see here in the next few verses are are some uh, options of people who choose a way that they're going to live, who choose the way that they're going to exist in this sin-cursed world. Remember, the word labor doesn't always mean that work you do to earn money to eat, right? We talked about that in chapter 3. We go to work so that we can eat, so that we can go to work, so that we can eat. And it's just that vicious cycle. Labor here includes more than that. When Solomon's talking about the labors that man is involved in, it's everything that man does to achieve that which he finds meaningful. Okay, so it's everything. All those pursuits that you're involved in, it's not just your work. Okay? It's everything. All those things that, that you are involved in. Right? And he's already told us that that's a gift from God for us to be able to do those things. So what he reveals to us here are some motivations that go behind what we do. All right? And we need to recognize that frustrations arise when there's wrong motivations. And so we're going to look at these motivations. And let's start in verse 4. For out of much of... I'm going to go back to Ecclesiastes. Let's go back to Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 4. He says, I have seen that every labor and every skill which is done is the result of rivalry between a man and his neighbor. This too was vanity and striving after wind. The fool folds his hand and consumes his own flesh. One hand full of rest is better than two fists full of labor and striving after wind. Then I looked again at vanity under the sun. There was a certain man without a dependent, having neither a son nor a brother, yet there was no end to all his labor. Indeed, his eyes were not satisfied with riches, and he never asked, and for whom am I laboring and depriving myself of pleasure? This too is vanity, and it is a grievous task. 
Two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. For if either of them falls, the one will lift up his companion. But woe to the one who falls when there is not another to lift him up. Furthermore, if two lie down together, they keep warm. But how can one be warm alone? And if one can overpower him who is alone, two can resist him. A cord of three strands is not quickly torn apart. I recognize that this passage is often used in weddings, and, and it's okay to do that because we recognize that God needs to be in that marriage and that these things are talking about a marriage relationship. But I think it, the application is broader than that. I think it's all our relationships. Not just the marriage relationship, but in all our relationships. And so what are those motivations that, that he reveals? All right. So let's kind of look at it. I'll just put them up here. All right, and we'll go back and talk to him. In verse 4, you see the ultra-competitive person. In verse 5, you see the lazy person. In verse 6, you see the person who is balanced or the person who has uh, contentment. And then in verses 7 to 8, you see the workaholic. All right? Those are all the, the different avenues that people can choose to achieve things. And, and he has some things to say about each one of those. Let, let's think first through the ultra-competitive person. All right. Some people determine that the way they're going to make it is they're going to step on everybody. They're just going to go after everyone that's around them so that they can get to the top. Regardless of who it is they hurt, they're going to go after that and they're going to get to the top no matter what. Now, being ultra competitive is, is not in itself sin because I know that there are probably some people sitting out here who are ultra competitive. All right. That in itself is not sinful. But he identifies here what does make it sinful. All right? When you look at verse 4, he says, the rivalry between a man and his neighbor. That's envy. When there is envy in that pursuit, when you look at Mr. Jones and you say, i got to keep up with Mr. Jones. In fact, I'm going to do better than Mr. Jones. You go after Why? Because you're jealous. That's when that ultra-competitive spirit has become sinful. And you're going to do whatever it takes to either put him down to get ahead by crushing his spirit, by maybe even making him look foolish or, or, or stupid. That's the ultra-competitive person. Solomon makes a point to show us that that, that is not the path of wisdom. Right? So he, he's using this comparison here. The world is full of Joneses trying to keep up with other Joneses. And the truth is, you'll never keep up. Verse 5 points out the lazy person. What, what he says there is um, the fool folds his hands and consumes his own flesh. He's going to the other end of this spectrum. And you've got that ultra-competitive person that's just go, 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 go. And you've got the fool that just says, oh, I can't do anything. Oh, I'm just no use. Why well, try? I'm just going to fold my hands. It's kind of like being on the inner tube in the lazy river. right? Just, just let the water flow. It's going to let it come. Not, not that there's anything wrong with the lazy river. Okay, I, that, that's okay. But the fool, and what's he say here? The imagery here is that the lazy person does nothing and he ends up consuming his, his own flesh, meaning that he's just going to waste away. He's wasting away, and, and the idea is the erosion, the erosion of self control, the erosion of his grasp on reality, the erosion of his self respect. Both ends of the spectrum are wrong. He doesn't want you to go there. Verse 6, he says the balanced person, the, the, balance, the person who is content. He says, it's better to have one hand full of rest than to have two hands full of labor. What, what, that person who has both hands grasped fully on that pursuit. I'm going after everything with all the gusto I can. And they just never get satisfied. And he says, it's better to just simply have one hand full and be content than to go through all the stress of trying to get everything this world has to offer. The simple life is a content life. That's what he's trying to get us to understand, is that those frustrations that come, we need people who are going to help us remind us of that. Look to the person who's content with what they have. Because the opposite end of that is verses 7 and 8, the workaholic. Notice what he says here about the workaholic. Then I looked again at vanity under the sun, and there was a certain man without a dependent, having neither a son nor a brother, yet there was no end to all his labor. That's the workaholic. There's no end. 
He's going after it, going after it, going after it. He's doing everything he can to increase his bank account, to have everything, all the gusto he can grab, and he's got no one to share it with. He has no heirs, no spouse, no children, no one to really pass it. Because what happens when he dies to all that stuff? Someone else gets it. And no one who he knows. In our country, we know who gets it, don't we? Uncle Sam. Uncle Sam gets more of it than we do, right? But just think about, you know, if you have no one to leave it to, Uncle Sam probably gets it all, right? So the idea there is that the workaholic, he, he's, he's pursuing everything, and he's, he doesn't have anyone to share his life with. So why are you doing what you do? Ultimately, the Scripture says, in 1 Corinthians 10.31, whether then you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. We need to ask that question in verse 8. Why am I doing all of this? That's what he said. For whom am I laboring and depriving myself of pleasure? Why am I expending all this energy? What's my purpose? He didn't ask that question hard enough. Because the answer is, we ought to be doing it for the Lord. And everything we do is to be able to share our life with others. And I think that's the point of, of what he's going on in the next section. Is it is better to share our life and work than to try and live life alone. Better to share our life and work than to try and live life alone. Let's look at verses 9 to 12. All right. Verse 9. Two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. For if either of them falls, the one will lift up his companion. But woe to the one who falls when there is not another to lift him up. Furthermore, if two lie down together, they keep warm. But how can one be warm alone? And if one can overpower him who is alone, two can resist him. A cord of three strands is not quickly torn apart. What Solomon does here is he gives us some reasons why relationships are better than, than being in isolation. Right? So I'm going to put them up here and we'll come back and talk about them here in just a moment. In verse 9, we see that it's better to have relationships because it helps our work be more productive. In verse 10, we see that it's good to have those strong relationships because we're going to help each other in those times of need and times of trouble. In verse 11, I know it kind of seems awkward, but we'll, we'll talk about that, keeping each other warm. What does that, that really mean? And then in verse 12, providing safety. All right, so, so let's walk through these and, and see what we're talking about. In verse 8, he had just shared about the miser who was living, like, doing things for himself. Right? And then he says in verse 9, two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. That man who was working as hard as he could to get nothing, it would have been a, it would have been a lot easier for him if he had partnered with somebody to share that. You can get more accomplished together than you can do on your own. Great things can be accomplished when we commit to working together. You know, we're in the process right now of, of gearing up for camp coming up in summer. In last summer, we had a great time at camp. It was a great time, what? Together, right? You know, Kurt's our director. What if Kurt just said, I'm going to do every position all by myself? We wouldn't see Kurt anymore. He would put himself in the grave. Right, Kurt? He would be in the grave. Plus, Kurt knows that he can't be in the kitchen because you ask his wife, he probably doesn't know how to cook very well. Right? Probably so. Ask his kids, right? Does he know how to cook? I don't know. All right? But he, could, he couldn't be a camp counselor. He couldn't be the game. Why? Because there's just not enough of Kurt to go around. So what does he do? He gets other people to help. Why? Because he knows he's not gifted in some of those areas, so he asks other people to help. Come. So what we're doing, we're coming alongside Kurt because Kurt has a great vision of camp and we love camp. And so it works great together. None of us can do it by ourselves. So you just take that and think about all the things that we try to accomplish in life. How much better it is when we're doing it together. That's the idea of verse 9. And then in verse 10, he, he talks about helping each other when they fall, right? In, in my warped sense of humor, when I read this, I immediately thought of that commercial. I've fallen and I can't get up. Right? What happens? When we're alone and we fall and we struggle to get up, we need somebody to come and pick us up. Now, sometimes that can happen to us physically, right? We can fall and hurt ourselves and, and we can't. So we need somebody to come along. But what about spiritually? 
When we fall spiritually, we need somebody to come alongside us and to pick us up, to help us, to lift us up, to get us back on the path. And so he says those relationships are are so important because we need each other to help support one another. Relationships are going to get broken. Financial difficulties can set in, can make us feel desperate. And if we're alone in life, those things can just really weigh down on us. So he says we need relationships to help us in that frustrating time of trouble. Now what about verse 11 when he talks about keeping warm? You know, at first we think of terms of marriage, and that, that is true. Okay, that, that, in, that in marriage, you know, those, those two uh, in, in, in bed there, they, they keep each other warm. But the idea here too is that in Solomon's time, there, there were people who were journeying. Sometimes they would journey by themselves, and at nighttime it would get very cold. And then they would have to go to sleep out in the wilderness, right? And so if they're out there by themselves, they're going to get colder than they would if there were two people together. We have a number of military people here. And I know a number of you are very familiar with this idea of two in a foxhole is a lot better than one in a foxhole, right? Because on those cold nights, if you're the only one in the foxhole, you're cold. But what do you do? You get together with that other guy that's in that foxhole with you and you keep yourselves warm by that body. That's the idea. Is that it's easier to stay warm, okay? It's easier to stay warm when you're in that foxhole together, right? And there's great wisdom in surrounding ourselves with people who are going to help keep us warm spiritually, right? We can tend to get cold spiritually, can't we? And our love for the Lord and our love for doing things for the Lord can wane. And so we need those people to come alongside us that can spark that fire in us, that can keep us warm, can keep those fires of service going when we want to give up. And so we need those people who are going to do that. The prayers of a prayer warrior. A person who has an encouraging verse that we need. The exhortation from a preacher or teacher. Those are helps that can get us going again. And then in verse 12, providing safety. Also on those journeys, it would be very difficult for the person who is traveling alone. You could be set in by robbers and just be attacked from all sides. And what deters those robbers from getting to you is when there are two or even when there are three. It's harder for them to overtake you when there's two, but if there's more than two, then that bond is even stronger and it protects. When facing dangers, two are always better than one. In the movie Batman Begins, Police Commissioner Gordon wonders, how can he ever bring a dangerous criminal to justice when he's all by himself? He's all by himself, so how, how can he stand against the evil forces of Gotham City? Then Batman swings in and he says, now we are two. That's what we need to be. We need to be like Batman swinging in and saying, together we're two. We can do this together. We can work at it. Even though we're traveling on a road that isn't as filled with as much danger physically, Our world is full of temptation, isn't it? There are a lot of spiritual dangers out there. And we need one another. Satan is always looking to devour us. And we need to be looking at ways in which we could be sticking together. And so you probably know at this point what I'm about to say, what what verse I'm about to pull up. And it's this one. Let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. I want to challenge you with this. That doesn't just apply to Sunday morning. That's not just applying to gathering for worship. That's applying to days beyond Sunday, to Sunday night, to Monday. Because you know the New Testament church, they met every day. They were encouraging one another every day. So our efforts of building these relationships can't just be satisfied by one hour a week every week. We've got to go beyond that. We've got to be intentional about building into one another's relationships and to building into our lives to encourage and to strengthen, to take the time to do that. One of our ministries that we were at in Indianapolis um, we had a great group of people who we not only met for Sunday school at, at our, our 9.30 hour, but then after worship, every Sunday, 
It was a given. We were going out to eat somewhere. And nobody even had to be asked. We were saying, hey, today we're going to Red Lobster. Come on. Right? And we'd just show up and we'd, have, we'd almost have another service right there because 20 to 30% of the congregation were there. And, and this was a church of over 300 people. And so you can imagine that restaurant being flooded by all these people. And it didn't just stop there. We were getting together on Monday with some other groups. And it, we were constantly involved in one another's life. And it took intentionality to do that. And it got to the point where it, it was just a given. We're going to do it. But see, sadly, we've gotten away from that kind of living. We've gotten away because we've filled our lives with so much other stuff that we, we don't take the time to recognize that, that our assembling together is more than just on Sunday morning. And, and one of the ways that we're trying to, to accomplish that is we have our fellowship with friends group. We're going to start that up again in the fall, but the, the groups are meeting now. And so uh, I encourage you to get involved. In that. Uh, we're having a great time, right? People just being together. And it doesn't just necessarily have to be that, but just being spontaneous. Hey, what you doing tonight? You want to come over? You want to go out? You want to go do something? Let's just be together. It takes intentionality. Good, strong relationships aren't just going to happen by osmosis. We've got to put effort to it. And that's what Solomon, I think, is going after here. Well, the last insight to gain, we'll kind of walk through this uh, uh, quickly because I know you guys are hungry. You want to get to eat. But it's choose your friends wisely. And this is the part of the text that's a little bit more difficult because you know, commentators are all over the place in what they say here. I think what this is, is Solomon is, is using a story. He's using a story here to illustrate his point. All right? A poor yet wise lad is better than an old and foolish king who no longer knows how to receive instruction. For he has come out of prison to become king even though he was born poor in his kingdom. I've seen all the living under the sun throng to the side of the second lad who replaces him. There is no end to all the people, to all who were before him, and even the ones who will come later will not be happy with him. For this too is vanity and striving after the wind. Let's kind of walk through this, and I think we can understand a little bit. Solomon contrasts three different kings. He contrasts three different kings, but they all have the same ending. Okay, We're going to see that. In verse 13, he makes it very clear that it's better to be a young, wise person than an old person who's set in their ways and won't receive instruction. Now, I, I'm not going to say if there are any old people here who have been set in their ways, but Solomon here would say to you, don't be that person. Don't be that person who can't learn. Right? So that's the first king. The second king is this king king who comes in, he, he, he's the young lad, and he comes out of a place of poverty. He comes out of a place of, because prison was that place where people, they would send people who couldn't pay their taxes and they'd have to, or, or, or pay their dues or whatever. They would go there until they were uh, able to serve off enough time to pay it. So it wasn't just necessarily a criminal, perhaps, but he, he, came, he came out of this life that you wouldn't expect a king to come out of. And people like him because he's wise. But then this other king, a third king comes in, and he comes in and he's just popular. All right? We don't really know a whole lot about that king. All we know is that he's popular. All right? That's what happens in verse 15. And then in verse 16, what happens is that third king, he loses his kingship because people grew weary of him. All right? So here, here's what we have. An old foolish man said in his ways is king number one. King number two is a young wise lad who rose up from the bottom of the ashes, right? And he's replaced by another young fellow who had this huge following, but after time, that king loses his following as well. So king one, his reign ended because he would not listen to advice. King two, his reign ended, even though he had all this wisdom, his reign ended because people liked this guy who was more popular, but King Three ended his reign because people grew tired of his leadership. So what that tells us is that people are going to be fickle. And we need to recognize that truth. In our relationships, the people are going to be easily swayed by allurements of someone else. It doesn't minimize the hurt but regardless of what we bring to the table, we need to recognize there are going to be people that just we shouldn't be friends with and people who just don't want to be friends with us because they find something else somewhere else. So the focus of our relationships ought to be built around Jesus Christ. 
and a mutual love for Him. And, and, and so as we draw this to a close, here, here's what I think Ecclesiastes 4 is telling us. The Ecclesiastes 4 friend is one who never forsakes you, but is willing to face injustice. They comfort you in times of trouble. They're not driven by envy, but willing to abandon their riches. They're not self-centered. They provide help along your journey, being willing to face the danger with you, and does not shift their loyalty like the fickle crowds. And that really sums up one person, Jesus Christ. He meets every one of those, doesn't he? He is the ultimate friend, the ultimate companion, who renounced his glory, gave up all the riches, put aside the wealth, everything. He faced injustice. Why? For us. And he's always going to be loyal. He's never going to forsake us or leave us. Solomon recognizes that human companionship is a great blessing. And so as I look at that list of the Ecclesiastes 4 friend, and we recognize that, that Jesus is the ultimate friend, I'm moved to ask us the question, what are we doing to exemplify Christ in that kind of friendship? Are we the kind of friend who's going to be loyal to our, our friends that, that regardless of what's going on in their life, we're going to stick with them? We're going to be that person who provides the comfort. We're not going to be driven by jealousy, but, but we're, we're going to go after that relationship. We're not self-centered. But we're providing help along the journey. We're going to face danger together and, and we're not going to shift our loyalties. So ultimately, our relationship with Christ is the first priority. What are you doing to make your relationship with Christ the ultimate priority in your life? How much time are you spending in His Word? How much time are you spending praying? How much time are you spending with His people? Those are all ways in which we can make our relationship with Christ a first priority. And regardless of how others view us, regardless of how others view us or treat us, we can choose to be the friend that others will want to need. Okay? Be that friend that others will want to have. Thirdly, as you focus on honoring God in your life, you can find your greatest reward in partnering with others. Don't be a loner. Don't be a lone wolf. Don't be a lone ranger. We need to be faithful. We need to increase our efforts of faithfulness. And then don't choose friends because of the externals. That's what was going on in verses 16, uh, verses 13 to 16. He, he, these were kings who you would think that everyone would want to be their friend because they're the king. But what happened? They lost them for whatever reason. Someone else came along, was wiser. Someone else came along, more popular. And they just keep switching. Choose your friends wisely. Not on externals, but on the internal. What's the character of the heart? Ultimately, let's be those kinds of people. For us to have these kinds of friends, we must be those kinds of friends. Let's ask for God's help. Lord, thank you for your word. And Lord, I thank you for Solomon and what he experienced in life to help provide some wisdom for us. So Lord, I pray that we would be able to focus on our relationships with one another, to strengthen them, to be intentional about them, to make efforts that show that our relationships mean more to us than any accomplishments we could have. We ask for your help in this process. In Jesus' name, amen.